Now on the History Channel, stories from the pages of time, stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement, as we go in search of history. During the Great Depression, certain financiers and industrialists plot to overthrow President Franklin D. Roosevelt and install a dictator in his place. To conservatives in general, and certainly to business people in particular, Roosevelt appeared as a traitor to his class. Could a plot to create a fascist state in the U.S. have succeeded? Considering the times and the money behind it and the power of the men behind it, they would definitely have been successful. Join us as we go in search of history to uncover the plot to overthrow FDR. The seeds of the plot to overthrow FDR were sown in the veterans movement that began after World War I. Then, veterans got $60 mustering out pay and a train ticket back home but felt they deserved more. After numerous compromises, the U.S. Congress finally passes legislation in 1924. World War I veterans receive a pension in the form of bonus certificates based on the time each man served. The certificates issued at the beginning of 1925 are redeemable with interest in 20 years when the average veteran will receive about $1,000. I think it was seen as a compromise. I think they were delighted, in fact, to have a bonus passed. Uh, they were obviously a lot less happy about having to wait 20 years to actually see the money. But by the spring of 1930, the U.S. economy is rocked by dramatic bank failures, shut down businesses, and foreclosed farms. The Great Depression begins. From late October 29 until March of 1933, the economy just went downhill. This created a kind of infectious pessimism. And of course, as more and more people feel that way, it just reinforces this, this attitude of, of doom and gloom. Nervous veterans groups, encouraged by populist politicians such as Congressman Wright Patman of Texas, demand that the bonus certificates be paid in full immediately. We're asking for the payment of a just and honest debt. It will be a godsend to this nation because the nation needs the additional purchasing power which this bill will afford. Government estimates put the bonus cost at roughly $2.2 billion, more than half of the 1932 federal budget. Opponents argue this is too expensive. There was a prevailing opinion that veterans shouldn't get any special benefits, that benefits should be extended over the vast population. Now, that obviously would have aroused considerable resentment and anger among veterans across the country. In 1932, roughly 20,000 veterans calling themselves the Bonus Army descend upon Washington to show support for the Patman Bonus Bill. They camp out in tents and hastily erected shacks. Some of the veterans take over condemned buildings. The police evict them by force. The veterans dig in, vowing to stay until they get the bonus. Then, on July 28, 1932, Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur defies President Hoover's orders and leads a regular Army force to drive the veterans from their encampments. In the ensuing melee, several veterans are killed and many, accompanied by their wives and children, are gassed and beaten. I think be fairly said that events got out of hand. At the time, I think they were hoping to be able to remove people fairly peaceably with a show of force. It didn't turn out that way. It was not a, a good day in American history. 
Herbert Hoover, his reputation already tarnished by his inability to deal effectively with the country's economic woes, is blamed for the incident. Herbert Hoover's presidency was at a standstill. Nobody knew what was going to happen. It was a very depressing period. Nobody thought there was a future. Veterans are not the only group disillusioned with the government. Wealthy Americans are also living in fear of losing what they have. These were people who had acquired great wealth and power. They knew that the world was fundamentally changing. They didn't know how it was changing. But certainly the same kind of people had backed Hitler and Germany and Mussolini and Italy. Benito Mussolini rose to power in 1925 with the help of corporate interests. His private militia, known as the Black Shirts, was comprised in large part by Italian World War I veterans. His fascist regime restored Italy's industrial viability. In the 1920s, uh, Mussolini in the United States was very popular, not just among Italian Americans, but among some reformers who thought of Mussolini as a kind of Italian Theodore Roosevelt, brought efficiency and vim and vigor to Italy. And there was curious interest in maybe bringing some features of Mussolini's regime, like the corporate state structure, to the United States. There are those who believe that this fascist model is the key to U.S. economic recovery. And in 1932, the mass of disgruntled veterans could be the instrument to make this change. Most of the countries of Europe in the 1930s were being led by dictators or quasi-dictators. And veterans groups had, in almost every instance, installed those people in power. Against this backdrop, the nation's attention is focused on the 1932 presidential election. New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt promises Americans a new deal. This is more than a political campaign. It is a call to arms. Franklin Roosevelt wins the presidency with an activist agenda to transform the very structure of American economic life. When Franklin Roosevelt came to office, he very quickly announced his intention to engage, as he called it, in bold, persistent experimentation to bring the economic crisis to an end. <laughs> Those words in and of themselves probably ruffled feathers. During the first hundred days of his administration, Roosevelt signs into law a dizzying array of programs designed to stimulate the languishing economy. Yet of all the unprecedented innovations brought by FDR, it is his decision to take the nation off the gold standard that most infuriates the Wall Street elite. I think probably there was a certain very childish element in some of these capitalists of that period of time. They just knew that man was in the White House and he didn't seem to know what he was doing. And there were people like Mussolini and others who did seem to know what they were doing and would surround himself with the right kind of people, them. According to sworn testimony before a congressional committee, it is sometime during the uneasy summer of 1933 that some of the wealthiest financiers and industrialists in the U.S. began to discuss the possibility of replacing the president with a dictator. They envision a paramilitary force of unemployed and disgruntled veterans as the source of their power. In order to put the plan into action, the plotters need to enlist a charismatic leader, a man on a white horse, to whom the veterans will pledge their loyalty and follow without question. They choose a very controversial soldier. As we continue in search of history, Retired General Smedley D. Butler is approached about leading a plot to overthrow FDR. As president, FDR supervised the largest fiscal entity on Earth, yet his mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, would not entrust her son with managing the family's money because she did not think he was up to the task. In Search of History, we'll continue here on the History Channel.
The plot to overthrow FDR returns. General Douglas MacArthur once described Smedley Darlington Butler as one of the really great generals in American history. The men behind the plot to overthrow FDR see him as a charismatic leader and one that they will be able to control. But there is a great deal more to this complex man than the plotters could possibly know. He was a bundle of contradictions. He was a Quaker, but he was as tough as they came. He was almost the stereotypical Marine that, given a job, he would salute and do it, no matter what. At age 16, Butler lies about his age in order to enlist to fight in the Spanish-American War. Over the course of the next two decades, he serves on battlefields all over the world, earning two Congressional Medals of Honor and rising to the rank of Major General. He led expeditions into Central American countries in furtherance of American foreign policy, which at that time was being dictated by the big corporations who had vested interests in these countries. Dollar diplomacy was the name of the game, and he was there to enforce it. When the U.S. enters the First World War, Butler desperately wants a combat assignment. Instead, he is placed in charge of an army camp in France called Pontanazan. The First World War was extremely frustrating for him. He had spent 20 years preparing for this gargantuan fight, and he was put in charge of Camp Pontanazan, the mud hole. He was not a happy Marine. While Butler may not have been happy with his assignment, Many of the two million men who passed through Camp Pontanazan during the war remember him fondly as the general who put their welfare above all else. After the war, he is appointed commandant of the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia. It is, however, a professionally frustrating period for him. I always wanted to be where the action was. He did not attend any war college of any kind. And he had some antipathy towards officers who had. He believed that officers would learn their trade best in the field, leading the troops. He resents the way that the Marine Corps is used to defend overseas investments, such as his 1927 assignment in China, to protect facilities owned by the Standard Oil Company. In some cases, Butler would say they were glorified policemen. They were Uncle Sam's policemen. He begins to publicly criticize U.S. foreign policy, and his opinions frequently get him into trouble. In 1931, when the post of Marine Corps Commandant becomes open, the expectation is that Butler will get it. But it goes to a rival with less seniority. He believed he was in line to become the next Commandant, but it was unfortunately a political position in addition to being a military position. It seemed outwardly that his enemies, both his political enemies and in the military, were out to get him. And this is certainly what Butler believed. It isn't long before General Butler retires from active duty in the U.S. Marine Corps. As a civilian, Butler earns his living as a professional speaker. No longer shackled by the rules of decorum and propriety which govern Marine officers, civilian Butler is free to express himself on any subject, at any time, anywhere. And he does. Who in the hell has done all the bleeding for this country and for this law and, and this Constitution anyhow but you fellas? In the summer of 1932, Butler travels to Washington to show his support for the veterans of the Bonus Army. Take it from me. This is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we have ever had. Pure Americanism. Willing to take this beating as you've taken it. Stand right steady. You keep every law. And why in the hell shouldn't you? This widely publicized appearance, days before General MacArthur will expel the Bonus Army from Washington, leaves an indelible impression on the public of Butler as a champion of the veterans. He has a common touch. 
He had sympathized with the veterans, and these veterans, after all, were people who had sacrificed for the country, and therefore were good, loyal peasants. And like a good, loyal peasantry could be relied upon to stand by the masters of the estate when the rabble came out from the city to take it over. Unwittingly, Butler finds himself in the minds of some as the perfect commander to lead a veteran's army. Someone sitting in New York on Wall Street could have anticipated that if a General Butler stepped forward and said, let's charge, a lot of pot-bellied and some not so pot-bellied veterans across the country would have said, yeah, let's charge. It's not implausible. Uh, it's a little cockamamie, but it's not implausible. On or about the 1st of July, 1933, Butler receives a visit from a World War I veteran named Gerald C. McGuire. According to Butler's later testimony, this visit will set in motion a bizarre plot to overthrow democracy and replace it with a fascist regime. As we continue in search of history, the plot to overthrow FDR starts taking shape. Elsewhere in the world in 1933, the U.S. and the Soviet Union established diplomatic relations for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution. Peru's President Sanchez Cerro is assassinated, and the DC-1 is introduced, designed to carry 12 passengers. In Search of History will return on the History Channel. The plot to overthrow FDR returns. Retired General Smedley Butler, now known as a passionate supporter of the Veterans Bonus Movement, is courted by veterans for all sorts of causes. In July 1933, two American legionnaires, Gerald McGuire, a World War I veteran from Connecticut, and William Doyle, a past Massachusetts state commander, visit Butler at his home near Philadelphia. They want him to run for the office of National Commander of the American Legion in order to oust the current leadership. He was constantly visited by people who wanted his help, including families of veterans who needed assistance, and which he always quickly gave. And so he didn't think too much about the early visits of McGuire and Doyle, they just more of the same. The general listens politely, but despite several appeals by the two legionnaires, he declares that he is not interested in becoming involved in American Legion politics and declines their invitation to attend the upcoming convention. Over the next two months, however, General Butler receives several visits from McGuire, who keeps trying to persuade him to attend the Legion convention. Butler admired persistence in a man, even though he may not have been in agreement with the principles that he was advocating. McGuire, who works as a bond salesman for a prominent Wall Street broker named Grayson M.P. Murphy, tells Butler that he is representing a group called the Committee for a Sound Dollar. The committee's primary goal is to convince President Roosevelt to reinstate the gold standard. The gold standard had a kind of sacred aspect to it, where you might think it was uh, a relic of the True Cross. Lewis Douglas who was Roosevelt's first manager of the budget, left the administration saying going off the gold standard was the end of Western civilization. Well, we now know it certainly wasn't the end of Western civilization, but at the time, an intelligent, rational man could hold such a belief. McGuire tries to convince Butler not only to attend the upcoming American Legion convention, but to deliver a speech McGuire shows him. It calls for a resolution demanding that the country return to the pre-New Deal gold standard. He wanted to know who wrote the speech. McGuire told him it was John Davis, who had been the presidential candidate in 1924 for the Democratic Party and was now the attorney for J.P. Morgan and Company. He was beginning to get very suspicious about this whole situation, and he decided to investigate it to find out what was behind this thing. In late August, while Butler is visiting Newark, New Jersey, McGuire appears at his hotel. 
Butler demands to know more about the people behind McGuire, insisting upon a direct meeting with the money men. McGuire agrees. In early September, as the American Legion convention is about to begin in Chicago, one of McGuire's principal backers, Robert Sterling Clark, visits Butler at home. Clark, himself a former Marine, had served under Butler during the Boxer Rebellion in China. Butler remembers him as the millionaire lieutenant who had inherited a fortune from his grandfather, one of the founders of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Clark claims that he is prepared to spend $15 million, half of his fortune, in order to protect the other half from devaluation. Clark lays out his belief that the popular General Butler could galvanize the veterans at the Legion Convention into forming an organization to oppose President Roosevelt on the gold issue. This is, as Butler recalled later, the first time the idea of having him lead a new veterans movement is explicitly laid out. The people interested in pursuing this train of thought, or perhaps this action, went to Butler because they didn't really know him. They knew his public persona. They assumed that he would be anathema to some of the governmental changes that were going on, and they assumed that he would keep a secret. And they were wrong. In January of 1934, Butler receives a postcard from Gerald McGuire. Postmarked Paris, it reads, hope to see you when I get back. Things don't look any too good over here. Troops everywhere. When McGuire returns later that summer, he arranges to meet Butler at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia. He steers the general to a table in the empty hotel restaurant and describes his contacts with European paramilitary organizations, such as Italy's black shirts and the stormtroopers of Germany. According to Butler, McGuire also describes a French organization he is particularly taken with called Croix de Feu, or Cross of Fire. It was a French organization of, of officers and non-coms, no privates, no lower, lower grade. And it was organized by the wealthy manufacturers in France to beat strikes and prevent strikes. And that was what he thought would interest uh, the American backers of the movement. McGuire indicates that, in his view, a similar veterans army of 500,000 men could be created in the U.S. He then implies that the financial interests that he represents would like Butler to lead this army. We don't know very much about the people behind McGuire, except that they were people involved with J.P. Morgan, General Motors, U.S. Steel, DuPont, and these are the most respectable corporate names in America. McGuire allegedly goes on to describe a fantastic scenario in which the president is compelled to appoint General Butler as leader of this paramilitary veterans group to a new cabinet position replacing the Secretary of State. The presidency is reduced to a ceremonial job, the vice president is pressured to resign, and Butler as Secretary of General Affairs makes actual policy decisions for the country. They knew that if Smedley Butler set out to seize the White House, there was nothing that would have stopped him short of a bullet. But they didn't know that Smedley Butler would have stood in front of that White House defending it. Feigning interest in the outrageous scheme outlined by McGuire, Butler determines to learn who is really behind it. Butler was playing amateur detective in a way. From the very beginning, the more he smelled of this thing, the rancor it got, and the more he was determined to ferret out the facts of it. McGuire doesn't provide the general with names, but he does tell Butler that sometime in the next few weeks, a new high-profile organization will be announced in the press. The purpose of this organization will be to maintain and protect the Constitution. In McGuire's words, there will be big fellows in it, including prominent Democrats. Shortly after this meeting, articles about a new organization do appear. It's called the American Liberty League and founded to protect the Constitution. It soon becomes apparent, however, that protecting the Constitution means protecting the U.S. from the policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
As we continue in search of history, the plot to overthrow FDR becomes the focus of a congressional investigation. The History Channel brings you In Search of History's The Quest. How many other U.S. presidents were related to Franklin D. Roosevelt, either by blood or by marriage? A. 1, B. 7, or C. 11? The answer when we return. In Search of History returns with the answer to The Quest. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was related to 11 other U.S. presidents, either by blood or marriage. He was also related to other leaders, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and Winston Churchill. Now we return to the plot to overthrow FDR. In 1934, the American Liberty League emerges as a formidable adversary to Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. The Liberty League probably had the highest per capita income of any political organization or lobby in our history. It consisted on the whole of the very rich who thought the New Deal was going much, much too far. They were so conservative that Herbert Hoover refused to join, saying that their Wall Street model of liberty was not for him. The League's membership roster reads like a veritable who's who of corporate America. Major funding comes from the DuPont family. Irene DuPont, president of the chemicals giant, is a well-known supporter of ultra-right-wing causes. Another prominent member is General Motors president John J. Raskob, a protege of the DuPonts and a former chairman of the Democratic Party. One of the reasons they got as much publicity as they did was because the leaders of the Liberty League were former Democrats who had supported Roosevelt. And then as he moved a little to the left, decided that he was a danger to the country. Al Smith, the former governor of New York, is perhaps the best known Liberty Leaguer. Smith, known as a champion of the common man, was the Democratic presidential candidate in 1928, losing to Herbert Hoover. In 1932, he sought the nomination again. When the party chose FDR instead, Smith became a bitter and outspoken foe of Roosevelt's New Deal, often referring to it as the Raw Deal. He was turned completely against Roosevelt. It was rather shocking to people who had believed in Al Smith as a good Democrat. Another prominent Democrat in the Liberty League is John W. Davis, who ran for president unsuccessfully in 1924. Davis allegedly wrote the gold standard speech that General Butler was asked to deliver at the American Legion Convention. Grayson Murphy was part of it. Clark was a part of it. All of these names figured in the American Liberty League, and that had to be the organization that McGuire had predicted it would appear, and it did. Butler now believes that the forces behind this plot are formidable and that they certainly have the resources at their command to succeed. In order to fight back, Butler needs help. He felt that because of his reputation as a battler in the Marines, uh, that his own credibility might be questioned. So he felt that he needed this validation from another reputable source, and that's why he turned to the Philadelphia record to support him. He enlists Philadelphia record reporter Paul Comley French to conduct a discreet investigation. Butler introduced him to McGuire, and McGuire was more candid with French than he had been with Butler. And he would make things like, uh, uh, oh, when we come out with this plan, the poor, the poor suckers will go for it. <laughs> he, was, he minced no, no words about it. During their meeting, McGuire reportedly advocates a fascist government to save the country from communism. As for the existing government, McGuire states, we might go along with Roosevelt and make him a figurehead like Mussolini did with the King of Italy. McGuire also supposedly tells French that funding for the plan will be provided by the J.P. Morgan banking empire. One of the Liberty League members, John W. Davis, is a senior attorney for the Morgan Bank. There were too many aspects of the plot which fit together, dovetailed. It was a genuine plot. 
but you'll never see any records of these Liberty League meetings, obviously, which could confirm that. By the fall of 1934, rumors about a Wall Street-financed anti-Roosevelt plot begin to circulate in Washington. Before long, they come to the attention of Congressman Samuel Dickstein, a liberal Democrat from New York. Dickstein, already concerned about pro-Nazi, pro-fascist activities in the U.S., gets congressional approval for an investigative committee he will co-chair. Investigators for the committee follow up on various leads regarding veterans' organizations. The trail leads them to Smedley Butler. Butler decides that it's time for him to go public. He calls a press conference, as seen in this historic footage. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. In November of 1934, the new Committee to Investigate Nazi Propaganda and Un-American Activities convenes in New York City in a session attended only by key members. Representative Dick Stein's co-chair is Massachusetts Congressman John McCormick, future Speaker of the House. There is no question that Dick Stein thought there was a real possibility of the far right coming to power in the United States, particularly an anti-Semitic far right. Uh, McCormick was a little more skeptical, but I think there was a real sense of that committee that exposure will stop these subversive movements. Once Americans know they're there, once Americans understand the danger. Butler, in his testimony, says McGuire bragged about his connections with the banking house of J.P. Morgan and Company. I said, don't you know that this will cost money? What are you talking about? He says, yes, we've got three million to start with on the line and we can get 300 million if we need it. Butler also claims that McGuire said some of the backers wanted Douglas MacArthur to lead the Veterans Army. MacArthur was not chosen because he was a son of non grata with all veterans in chasing the bonus army out of Washington. Paul Comley French is the next witness called. In testimony that backs up Butler, French describes what McGuire told him about the conspiracy. He continually discussed the need of a man on a white horse, as he called it, a dictator who would come galloping in on his white horse. French also testifies that McGuire had confided to him how the plotters planned to obtain arms and equipment. I do not think he mentioned the connection of the DuPonts with the American Liberty League, but he skirted all around the idea that that was the back door. One of the DuPonts is on the board of directors of the American Liberty League, and DuPont owns a controlling interest in the Remington Arms Company. Later that day, Gerald McGuire is called to testify. McGuire acknowledges that he had met with General Butler on several occasions, but when questioned, he denies ever having conversations with Butler regarding European veterans' organizations. Did you tell him at that time that you went abroad and looked into the setups of the governments there and the parts that the veterans played in Italy? No, sir. Under the fascist government? No, sir. Did you say that they were the real backbone or background of Mussolini, but that the system would not apply in America? No, sir. The veterans were never mentioned when I met with General Butler. In his testimony, McGuire provides an altogether different portrayal of his relationship with General Butler. I always thought this fellow Butler was a friend of mine. He asked me any number of times about different outfits in the country that wanted him to talk to them. And I always said to him, General, you're crazy to get mixed up in these kind of things. But vexing questions are raised about McGuire's activities in Europe on behalf of his benefactor, Robert S. Clark. Letters written while he was in Europe contradict McGuire's denial that he was studying fascist veterans organizations. There is a distinct weakness now as regards the government in power. The strength would be brought about by a coup d'etat. I had a very interesting talk last evening with a man who is quite well up on affairs here, and he seems to be of the opinion that the Quoi de Faux will be very patriotic during this crisis. Despite this evidence, McGuire continues to dispute General Butler's allegations of a plot to overthrow FDR. It's a joke, a publicity stunt. I know nothing about it. The matter is made up out of whole cloth. I deny the story completely. 
Robert S. Clark, who had paid for McGuire's European trip, lives in France and the committee has no power to subpoena him. He is never asked to testify. When the committee calls no further witnesses, gossip sweeps Washington that the White House wants the matter to be swept under the rug. Roosevelt was a master of retreat as well as attack. I just don't think in his political calculations it made any sense for him to pursue this. He might need some of these people still. The initial reports of Smedley Butler's allegations are followed by an avalanche of denials in the press. The American Liberty League questions the sanity of General Smedley Butler. There were the accusations that he was mentally unstable at the time. I don't believe this for one minute. And if he were mentally unstable, was Paul Conley French mentally unstable too? This is just a question of sour grapes and of attempting to discredit Butler. The committee, though, believes General Butler and says so in its final report. Your committee was able to verify all the pertinent statements made by General Butler. There is no question but that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. In the aftermath of the congressional hearings, however, there is no attempt to pursue legal action against any of the prominent individuals implicated by Butler and French. As we continue in search of history, allegations of a cover-up trigger General Smedley Butler to fight back. Two years after the McCormick-Dickstein Committee completed its investigation, Representative Samuel Dickstein received $12,000 to spy for the Soviet Union while he was still in Congress. After two and a half years, he was fired for not delivering good enough information for the money. The plot to overthrow FDR returns. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. General Smedley Butler believed he acted as a latter-day Paul Revere in raising the alarm about a conspiracy to overthrow the Roosevelt administration. In the weeks that follow his testimony, however, the plot seems to be downplayed in the press. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institutions. I want to retain the right to vote, uh, the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. None of the prominent individuals named, such as Grayson M. P. Murphy or Robert S. Clark, are ever asked to testify. References to the American Liberty League and its prominent members, such as Irene DuPont, John Raskob, and Al Smith, are omitted from the final report submitted to Congress. These references are ruled as hearsay. I asked McCormick why there was no uh, reverberations from the plot, why it didn't go any further. And he didn't seem to know the answer. When I asked Dickstein that question, Dickstein told me, he said, well, we did our part, and now it's up to the Department of Justice. And that's all he knew about it. Starting in 1940 with the Smith Act, uh, you have legislation where you can move against alleged subversion on the basis of conspiracy indictments. But in the 1930s, uh, you don't have anything like that. It's, it's unclear what you could prosecute people for in this instance. It's mostly loose talk. It's peacetime. In World War I, people were sent to prison for loose talk. But it wouldn't have occurred in peacetime. To this day, there is speculation that Franklin Roosevelt or someone in his inner circle of advisors personally discouraged any follow-up to the investigation. It's difficult for us to remember or to think now about how closely knit the leadership cadre, if you will, of this country was back in those days. They all knew each other. They shared a common culture. They rode on the same trains together and engaged in long conversations. These were family fights. 
So if it was a family fight, you kept it in the drawing room and out of the hearing room. When General Butler learns that key points of his testimony are omitted from the committee's report, he takes his case to the public. Radio station WCAU in Philadelphia gives him a forum. Like most committees, it has slaughtered the little and allowed the big to escape. The big shots weren't even called to testify. Why wasn't Colonel Grayson M.P. Murphy, New York broker, called? Why wasn't Al Smith called? And why wasn't General Douglas MacArthur, Chief of Staff of the Army, called? A month after the report is sent to Congress, Gerald McGuire, the only witness who could have shed more light on the shadowy figures behind the plot, dies of natural causes at the age of 37. During the next two years, the American Liberty League remains a thorn in the side of President Roosevelt. Whatever fantasies the Liberty Leaguers might have had, uh, the reality was they tried to defeat Roosevelt in an election in 1936. They failed and they went out of business. They didn't go shopping for another general in 1937. As FDR gears up for re-election, the president doesn't hide his feelings about the men who allegedly plotted to turn him out of the White House. And the privileged princes of these new economic dynasties, thirsting for power, reached out for control over government itself. By the end of his first term, President Roosevelt is a man distressed in many respects. The economy, while it had started to improve, is now showing signs of weakness again. And so we have him at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia in 36 making this famous statement about economic loyalists. This is very much uh, Roosevelt making a decision that he's either got to challenge them and hope that his constituency backs him up in this, or, or he's nowhere. The country does back him up, handing FDR and the Democratic Party a landslide victory and an even larger majority in Congress. Smedley Butler, ironically, becomes one of Roosevelt's loudest critics. The great mass of open-minded Americans who are not blindly bound by party allegiances and whose votes really decide elections, again, have come to the conclusion that the Democratic Party cannot run this country. The issue, however, is not the president's economic policies. Butler challenges the president on whether Americans should fight on foreign soil. As World War II approached, he felt that the only thing that the Americans should do was keep their soldiers and their Navy at home and fight and destroy anybody who attempted to invade or attack the United States. But he didn't see sending Americans to die on foreign soil anymore. He'd seen too much of it. And that clouded his vision as to what World War II was really about. My personal opinion, if Smedley Butler lived into the World War II years, is that within five minutes of hearing about the attack on Pearl Harbor, he would have fired off a letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps wanting to come back on active duty. He was first and foremost a Marine. But Smedley Butler was never to wear his uniform again. He dies of pancreatic cancer on June 21st, 1940. Whether there was an actual plot to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or whether it was the musings of some disgruntled men, remains controversial. There have been rumors of plots to overthrow the government since 1933. During the last days of the Watergate scandal, rumors spread that Nixon was going to order out the troops and not resign. That was nonsense. It has about as much reality to it as the notion that Butler was going to seize the White House. But the 60s, like the 30s, was an apocalyptic time when those rumors spread. One could speculate that if this fantastic plot to overthrow FDR had succeeded in 1934, the U.S. might well have allied itself with the fascist powers of Europe, and the outcome of World War II would have been decidedly different. A chilling thought as we continue to go in search of history.